Hello, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Loretta Joseph, a fintech and regulatory framework specialist, presently based in Mauritius, where she is, among other things, consulting to the Financial Services Commission. Hello, Loretta. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Distributed finance, DeFi. We all talk about it as if we know exactly what it is. Tell us, what is DeFi? So DeFi, in two words, is what we call decentralised finance. It's different from traditional finance because it's a movement that leverages decentralised networks to perform um, old financial market products. So we're used to, in the old financial world, a, a censored, closed loop, um, controlled protocols. This relies on transparent, trustless protocols that don't require any, any intermediaries. In the old finance world, um, we rely heavily on intermediaries, but in in the world of blockchain, there is no need for third parties because we trust mathematics will do the job as the trusted intermediaries have done in the financial markets for hundreds of years. And what are the benefits of DeFi to the users? So I think um, you know, in traditional finance, if we look when I'm talking about that's borrowing, lending, savings, um, asset management, decentralised exchanges, anything that you thought you could do in the old banking world, you can do now with DeFi. Um, in the traditional finance world, we all had to be KYC'd and AML'd. It's very closed source. It's censored. Um, it's very legacy systems and they're slow. So the benefits of the decentralised world is that we, we remove all those um, those nuances of what we had in the old world. The risk is that now I can perform any banking function, as I said, um, buy, sell, borrow, lend, um, be a derivatives trader um, with a wallet address and that's it. So nobody knows who I am. Um, if I go onto the internet today and I go and buy um, my groceries, I have to give my mother's left arms, um, dog's name and every every bit of history that is related to my my. Um, my ID. With DeFi, I don't have to give any of that. So it has it has pluses and it also has minuses. If I'm a traditional bank, insurance company, asset manager, can I benefit from this technology or should I feel threatened by it? I think the first knee-jerk reaction um, from bankers, and it certainly happened when Bitcoin came into existence, which is the first blockchain um, application in 2008, is to react with, with and be threatened. Incumbents are always threatened by technology and innovation that comes out of new technology. Um, but I think there's also a point that traditional finance will always have a place for certain um, sectors of the, of the economy. And decentralised finance is now coming in to probably um, playing a role in sectors of the economy where centralised finance was not possible or not needed. So there's, I think there's positives and negatives. Talking of, of blockchain, we see now a kind of boomlet developing in DeFi tokens, which reminds quite a few observers of the ICO boom of 2017, 2018. What are the risks of this technology as it starts to gather pace and accelerate? So like we were looking at the ICO boom of um, the 2017-18 space when I first started to write regulation to stop what I saw as an, inher an inherent space where consumers and investors were being scammed, we're seeing the same thing develop out of DeFi. I think... Um, Everybody thinks when they're, you know, they're into something that's, that's new and technology and you know, the, these, these digital asset classes are new, a new ground for everybody, but they come with risks. And I think regulators are scared that the same thing will happen, that consumers and investors won't understand um, the risks that they're taking on when they delve into these projects. And you know, buy everywhere. We as regulators have to protect consumers and investors. That's exactly what we do. Um, but I think a lot of the time when the technologists are building these new platforms, they don't understand regulation and, and nor do most 25-year-old technologists that are just building things because they think they're cool. So um, this has a lot of, of um, remnants of what I saw with the ICO boom in 2017, 18. The first thing regulators do is that they react and this movement is no different. A permissionless trustless networks and regulations sound like contradictions in terms. Can we have regulated trustless permissionless networks? 
Um, well, I, well, I think the, the role of the regulators is really starting to change because over the years, what did we do? Um, for the financial system, as we saw, we regulated the intermediaries. That protect, protected the consumer and investor. All of a sudden, we've taken out the intermediaries. So what are we protecting? Um, are we really trying to tell a bunch of millennials that, you know, that, that they can't do use technology because there's risk? No. All we can say is, Beware. No asset class goes one way forever. We all know that. Um, but but I, I think what you will see develop out of this is I think regulation will actually win because regulation and code and putting uh, yeah, source code in for regulators in these trustless, these um, trustless permissionless networks is where we'll see regulation go. So I, I just think um, the format of what we regulate and how we regulate it will change, but the regulation to protect consumers, investors is going to remain regardless of what technology comes along. It's a clear answer. The role of the regulator now is to protect the investors, not the intermediaries, because there are no intermediaries. Is that how you would characterise if you look at regulators around the world, is that how you would characterize their behavior as a group? They're looking at, at DeFi as an investor protection issue. Um, I think they are. And again, we as regulators are generally not technologists and technology technologists are generally not regulators. So you have two very different worlds colliding. Um, that's sort of been my main job over the last few years is bringing those two worlds, worlds together. Um, yeah, investor protection and consumer protection is by far the only thing that regulators can do. We can't stop people using technology and nor should we, but they need to understand buy beware that everything has risk. And this particular um, application of blockchain is incredibly risky. And, but as long as people understand that, you know, off you go, everything, uh, everything has, has a market force. And I think we can't stop um, market forces, but I think all we can say is, okay, you get into this, you beware, and you understand that you can lose everything that you put in. So buy beware is very important. And I think um, regulators are struggling with the technology. We're, we're, we're always in trouble for struggling um, and being behind technology and innovation. I think we're at par now to keep up. And this is particularly interesting because in a lot of these DeFi projects, they talk about food. So you've got the YAM project and this, yeah, and regulators think it's a joke. But this is the problem, that it's not a joke and, and, and um, programmable money that has come out of Ethereum is, yeah, is going to be the next big thing that we see over the next, um, you know, the next five years. I think the one thing that we can say and we can trust as regulators, we know that the protocol that these things are being built on at the moment is Ethereum. Um, not to say that many more protocols will be now developed out of this, but Ethereum doesn't scale. We've seen big problems with you know, the people trying to get in and out of Ethereum that are using these projects. Um, it's called Ether. The Ether price has skyrocketed. So I think in, in, in itself, um, regulators won't be too worried as long as, as these issues continue with this protocol. I think the big concern is when other protocols, like there's one I look at, Polkadot, um, they start to deliver exactly the same products and services on uh, protocols that scale and are interoperable. Then we're going to have um, more interesting problems for the regulators. You mentioned looking, looking five years ahead. If you look at where we are now in terms of the products which are being developed for DeFi, give us a flavor of the products you're seeing now and a flavour of the products you expect to see in, in five years' time. You mentioned programmable money, but maybe look, look now and then look five years ahead. What sort of products would you put on the lists so, now and then? So when I looked back and I started to talk about central bank digital currencies back in 2016, and I thought every central bank governor I walked into was going to punch me in the head, um, I then move on to, to where we sit now with CBDCs. That is just a given we know that's going to happen um i'm looking at every every line of banking so where you're a borrower you're a creditor you're a lender um you're an asset manager you're a decentralized crypto exchange wait for those things to hit the market um everything that a bank and financial services can do now DeFi can do I think in five years, we're going to have new products and services that we haven't even thought about. I mean, I think what Ethereum gave to the world was not much other than the concept of tokenization, the ability to tokenize every asset class. Bitcoin was the tokenization of money. 
Um, but I think now, now that everything, every real asset can do us in the world can be tokenized, the products and services that are going to come out of these new ecosystems are beyond the comprehension of even the greatest economists or technologists. So in five years, I really don't have that crystal ball, but I know the world of um, financial technology and I know the world of DeFi is going to be a very different one that we're sitting at today. Clarissa Joseph, thank you very much. Great to talk to you. Thank you for having me.